Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. It's great to see uh, a lot of uh, old friends, uh, good friends, new friends, uh, new colleagues in the space today. Um, we're going to uh, give a chance for everyone to kind of make it in um, and be a part of the conversation. Um, so uh, we're going to give it another couple minutes and just get started. So if you haven't had that chance to uh, grab that a uh, cup of coffee yet for the afternoon, or if you need to take a si quick second, we'll get started in just about one, two minutes. Welcome. Got a few folks still coming in. Wonderful. Um, I think it's time. Let's just jump in and get started. I know more people will be joining kind of throughout the course of the time. Um, and we'll be, I uh, just want to say, first off, thank you to all the folks uh, that kind of were a part of uh, building out the uh, event today, the folks at Seat Common Ground, Open System, ECRN, our advisory group. Well, you get a chance to meet everyone over the course uh, of, the, of the next hour and a half. But uh, my name is Landon Mascareñas. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the Open System Institute, um, and I can't, I've just been so eager for this event. We've been working on uh, the Cornerstone Project since uh, last fall, and just the opportunity to bring everyone into the space today is just uh, tremendously exciting. Um, uh, I'm going to move us into uh, our next piece, which is uh, please share your name, um, organization, and state in the chat. Um, and, if the, and if you're a member of our exploratory committee, uh, folks who have stepped up to say that they are really excited about the opportunity to bridge together education and democracy, uh, redesign work, uh, please also uh, name that in the chat so that folks can get a chance to see uh, the incredible uh, spectrum of folks who have uh, stepped up to be a part of this conversation. And we really can't wait uh, to get in and be a part of the learning. So I'm going to take a look at this chat here and just see um, all the folks coming through. Um, love seeing uh, the incredible uh, national uh, diversity um, in the space. So it's really great. Um, as folks keep uh, you know putting their um, names in the chat, um, naming kind of their connection to the project. I'm going to keep moving forward here. Just a little bit of an agenda uh, for our time today. Um, we're kind of in this uh, opening space. Uh, we're going to get a chance for you to meet some of the other co-leads um, that have been a part of this project um, and for them to share a little bit not only about their why, uh, but some of the really important aspects to the work that they see uh, in terms of thinking through some of the key education democracy infrastructure uh, perspectives that need to be uh, built out. Um, we really are in a moment of uh, democracy crisis, opportunity, transformation um, here in our society right now. And we think that uh, the education community and the democracy community could have an incredible way of bridging and connecting um, over the course of this time. So you're going to hear some folks talk about that. Um, we're going to, you're going to hear from uh, some results from a, a survey that was nationally conducted um, before the new year of uh, with 22 states and a ton of organizations. Um, sharing their perspective on the opportunity uh, to intersect uh, education and democracy or uh, redesign work. Um, and then you're going to hear from the two co-chairs of our exploratory committee. One, uh, the incredible uh, Kira Orange-Jones, a uh, friend of many on this call, a former uh, vice president of the Board for Elementary and Secondary Education in Louisiana, and uh, Nathan Lockwood, uh, who's been uh, an emerging great friend of mine in this network runs uh, executive director of Rank the Vote, uh, a national organization promoting ranked choice voting around uh, the country. It's going to be an incredible uh, way to get the two of them, leaders in the space, uh, to talk through uh, how they see the intersection of education and democracy right now 
uh, for the opportunity to rebuild and redesign some of this infrastructure. Um, and one of the things that we've uh, you know, learned over the course of the survey uh, and some of our conversations is that there's a lot, huge opportunity to learn more together. Uh, so a good part of our time uh, today will be to talk through what it could mean to see stuff like proportional representation, ranked choice voting, and education, quality education, civil right um, in the space of our communities and our time. Um, and then we'll give you some chance in regional breakouts um, to uh, get to know each other across regions, reconnect with some old uh, friends and colleagues, and then end with some next steps and gratitude as we go on this learning journey together. So uh, that's our time today. Um, our co-leads, uh, the organizations that have come together to really get started on this, just the beginning, um, Education Civil Rights Now, um, Ben, uh, we'll hear from him in a second, uh, Donnie, myself at the Open System Institute, um, and uh, Seek Common Ground, uh, an organization dedicated to bringing people together across issues. Uh, and so with that, um, we're going to open up to uh, hear from some of those leaders about why they're involved in this work and, the, and why they see the moment. So with that, we'll turn it over to Sandy. Thanks, Landon. Um, thanks. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many old friends. And I feel like, uh, I don't know, there are at least like 10 follow up phone calls based on people that are in the, the chat already that I feel like I need to have. So it's just it's great to see so many folks here. Um, I think like a lot of you, I, I entered this conversation um, worried about two things, right? Worried about both the, the future of public education um, after having gone through a period of so many attacks on on public institutions and efforts to undermine public education. Um, and also our work at Seat Common Ground really has, has made us very close to both students and families. And we really have, I, I think, understand more than ever before how much folks depend on schools and communities and how much people want to be part of conversations about what that should look like. And so like a lot of you, I've, I've been worried about public education, and I've also been worried about democracy, um, especially attempts to limit rather than broaden participation. And I always had in the back of my head this idea that democracy and education were linked together, but it wasn't until uh, I saw this quote from John Lewis that I really, it really sort of brought it all home to me again that you know, education really is the cornerstone of democracy. Um, people have been saying that since our founding. And I wondered if that was true, how we could actually put those pieces together and, and what it would actually mean. What would the how look like? So I've been excited to be in conversation with Landon and Donnie and Claudia from Seat Common Ground, who you'll meet more in a minute, and Ben and Elizabeth and others uh, to really figure out what the how looks like. Um, and and how we might actually both strengthen democracy and strengthen education at the same time. So I'm excited to learn alongside the rest of you what this might look like and how we might work together. So thank you again. Thank you, Sandy. We'll turn it over to Donnie. Hey, y'all. Uh, it's so great to see everyone. Um, I am just so excited to be here with all of you and to be able to talk to about these critical issues. Uh, Landon and I started the Open Systems Institute to directly confront the trust and legitimacy challenge that really confronts public institutions broadly, but education systems in particular right now. And we do this by developing and amplifying novel approaches for systems to be responsive and co-creative with the communities that they're embedded in. And when I think about the challenge and the uh, that's in front of us, you know, it can feel dim. Uh, it can feel uh sort of you can freeze in analysis paralysis but we wanted to present a little bit of a vision here to think about where this all this incredible work could go uh in order to inspire us and keep us moving in this incredible work um we want to underscore the idea that first we can restore our trust in public institutions uh, and in the idea and the dream of an equitable education system that's more democratic fundamentally and we think that we can collectively spur a new age, a, a new era of democratic innovations through local experimentation. Um, and that could lead to greater national adoption as well. And these, this local work uh, and these innovative state level reforms, we think have a really strong and powerful chance to influence national policy 
it can really like help us develop a new and advanced vision for education and democracy. And you know, one of the things that I think we're we're facing in this moment right now is this feeling that education races can sometimes actually not be seen as particularly central or crucial. And that, that actually might be an interesting feature, not a bug, uh, and that it could actually cultivate a sense that innovations in that space are safe to try, uh, and that we might be able to develop new approaches in that kind of context uh, that can pave the way for broader shifts. Um, and so hopefully we can all engage in this vision together. Thanks for letting me uh, kick it off a little bit here. Thanks, Donnie. Um, and we'll turn it over to Ben Austin at Education Civil Rights Now. Hi, I'm Ben uh, at Education Civil Rights Now, uh, working to make quality public education a civil right uh, for all children in America. Uh, and I am also uh, excited to be in community with this badass uh, group of leaders, um, both because uh, I care about American democracy not being a total dumpster fire, um, but also because I think as education advocates, we've all very much been going to Vegas trying to win against the House, playing a fundamentally rigged game because children can't vote uh, and parents don't have lobbyists. Uh, and this is about um, reorienting the underlying physics of education democracy um, so that the interests of children are represented both in the electoral process as well as in the governance aspect of it. Um, I think I've been tasked with explaining what edu races are. Um, and, um, uh, you know, fundamentally, it's how we go about electing uh, ed our education leaders uh, that can be uh, that can apply to school board races, superintendent of public instruction races, state board of education races, or even mayoral races in places where there is uh, mayoral control. Um, so uh, excited for this conversation and excited to kind of uh, figure out how we make the whole greater than the sum of the parts when it comes to our work in education advocacy and democracy reform in this moment. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate that. Um, we're going to turn it over to Claudia and Sandy to talk a bit about uh, what we learned from our survey of education organizations uh, from around the country. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Landon. It's so great to see everybody here today. Um, my name is Claudia Quintero, and I'm Senior Director and Co-Founder of Seat Common Ground alongside Sandy Boyd, who uh, you just uh, heard from. And so as we began discussions around the Cornerstone Project, we wanted to get a sense of what the field was already thinking and feeling with regards to the intersection between education, justice, and democracy to inform this work. So to do that, we conducted a brief survey using Google Forms. Uh, so it's not something we would send to the New York Times or anything by any means, but we did want to capture a snapshot in time to gauge interest of the field in this topic. Um, and this survey really did give us some insights that are quite interesting that we wanted to share with you all today. So just a quick overview of who participated in the um, survey. So we conducted this, uh, like Landon said, in December of last year for a couple of weeks. There were 55 respondents and those respondents represented 22 states and a few that we're working with at a national organization. Um, something that we did find interesting was precisely that mix of organization types that did take the time to fill out the survey. Um, so on this next slide, uh, you'll see that there's quite a range of the organization types. Um, so there's national state and local advocacy organizations, community-based organizations, organizations that support education institutions or actually provide education services. Uh, consulting firms, philanthropic organizations, think tanks and research organizations, as well as networks of state and local advocates. And something that we did find encouraging was also that there were respondents that filled out the survey without their affiliations, uh, which just shows us that there's also interest in these issues, even in people's personal time outside of work. Um, so to kick off some of the high level takeaways from the survey, uh, we just first wanted to start by asking if folks saw that connection as well between democracy and education justice. And as you can see here, over 80% of the respondents thought that they were very connected, um, which is really encouraging to us. And also um, we wanted to see how interested they were in actually working on some of these issues. And so uh, we saw that about half of the respondents said that they were very interested, uh, but overall it's just really encouraging to see that this chart shows an arc towards being interested in working on these issues. 
And as Sandy shared earlier, um, you know, here at Seat Common Ground, we uh, work with national work to facilitate national learning communities. And so we also wanted to get a sense um, and keep in mind the capacity that respondents might actually have to engage in a learning community on these issues. And so um, although we see a lot of interest, we also see that there's a mix of capacity to engage. And just to note, even though we didn't define capacity, we're you know, aware that that means time and staffing and or funding to participate in a learning community like this. So we've just seen in the past from other networks that we've run of being really mindful of um, capacity means that we can have a variety of opportunities for engagement so that as most most people can um, participate and as many as possible can participate in whatever way um, they can and hope to. So as I noted before, we're really encouraged to see that there's people who are even willing to do um, some of this work on their own time, even if their organization might have not have the capacity at the time. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to Sandy to share some more insights from the survey. Thanks, Claudia. Um, so what I think is interesting about this slide, and it's um, it's consistent with a lot of the um, open responses that people uh, uh, shared with us also, is that people felt, um, much like my opening comments, a lot of urgency around protecting democracy, worries about democracy, and whether um, folks knew or had a real sense, and I'll admit that this would have included me, you know, what education democracy meant, there was just this like really high sense of urgency around it. And yet when we asked the question about how often are people in our space talking about education, uh, about democracy reform or education races, um, the numbers were much lower, kind of a mismatch between the urgency folks are feeling and an actual conversation, much less action in the space. So we found that interesting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, I should, I want to reinforce what Claudia said about this is, you know, in no way a, this is very much a snapshot. It's in no way kind of a, you know, scientifically rigorous survey, and it doesn't necessarily reflect what some of you on the phone feel about these issues. Um, this was kind of an early look back in December of what people said. Um, so even now, I think people's responses might be a little bit different, but Let's just say that this slide, I think, represents on the issue interests, both the governance, what we would call the governance and the electoral issues that we're going to dive into a little bit more deeply um, today, that whether people knew much about e any of these issues, there was a high, high level of interest in all of them. Obviously, the highest level in public education is the civil right, but even issues, uh, you, you know, that rank as high as like 35% or higher, people really are interested, were interested, uh, want to learn more and um, figure out how these might intersect with the other issues that they're currently working on. Um, so we found that to be really encouraging, even though we did not think even in December that we necessarily had a complete list of issues, education, democracy issues that folks might be interested in. This was a pretty good, pretty good start of the list. Next slide. Um, which this was just kind of interesting again, where we sort of saw the interest across the country. Uh, uh, lots of folks were only interested in education as a civil right. Others were only interested in governance reforms. Uh, others in only electoral reforms with um, education as a civil right, and in other places, more of a mix. This also gives you a sense of like where we where we saw most of our results um, come from. And finally, when we were thinking about and when we asked the question about having a national uh, learning community around education and democracy and what resources people uh, really needed. Uh, there was a lot of, and, and this especially came through in the open response, there was a lot of uh, real honest responses about how like, I am interested in this, but I don't know very much, or I don't know how it fits together, but I want to learn. And so I think you'll see in what we're doing today and what we do going forward, a real attempt um, for all of us in having a learning agenda as well as an action um, agenda, because for a lot of us, um, some of these issues are quite new. So folks were interested in policy and research, communications and advocacy, having regular virtual meetings. I'm 
I know we all have tons of regular virtual meetings. So the fact that 76% of you right before Christmas said you wanted to have more, that's um, that's really saying something about the urgency of the issue and um, also a pretty high response for an in-person meeting, which we of course would love to do. And with that, I think I'm turning it back over to Landon. Thanks, Sandy and Claudia. I really appreciate uh, that and uh, your efforts and partnership at Seat Common Ground to put this together. Um, like you said, this was just the beginning, uh, you know, and that uh, I'm I've you know been really struck by since uh, we got that survey back. That point you made, Sandy, about the delta between people's urgency and I think as a society, we we a lot of us feel that existential urgency to transform democracy, or some people say save democracy, and then. What do we actually do about it? And I think often in education, we can feel like that's someone else's job. That's someone else's job to care about our democracy. But I think the fundamental premise of the Cornerstone Project is that actually education and our education democracy has a critical role to play in reimagining and redesigning the future of what that could look like. And I think that's a killer uh, way to segue into our next conversation uh, with our two exploratory committee co-chairs as we really go on this journey. Um, we're just honored to have uh, Nathan Lockwood, uh, the executive director of Rank the Vote, and uh, Kira Orange-Jones, the CEO of Teach Plus, and uh, former election uh, ele education democracy pr uh, participant uh, as, a, as a state official in Louisiana, um, here with us to begin a conversation uh, about um, why they think the moment is now to lean into this conversation, these strategies, these opportunities, and what it means next for us in connection. So welcome, uh, Kira and uh, Nathan. Excited to be a part of such an important consequential conversation. Yeah, same here. Really honored to, to be with you folks today. Uh, let's, Kira, let's start with you. Um, let's let's start with your why now. Uh, let's talk about your experiences uh, in uh, education, education democracy, uh, and why it's critical that you think we need to move on this as a field. Well, it's a big question, Landon, and I will just start by saying I, I enter this conversation with a great deal of humility, and I think that's really for two reasons. The first is um, this is really like a new space and conversation for me personally, right? Um, and I think uh, this was alluded to earlier. I think for many of us who enter this conversation from the like education reform kind of pathway in, um, you know, including myself. For, for the larger part of the past 20 years, although I've always believed deeply in democracy, right, and have always saw my work as peripheral um, and saw education reform and reforming educational systems as a way to kind of generally speaking, improve democracy in the broadest sense, I have never thought of my work as strengthening democracy per se directly, right? Um, I thought those were two different things, related but quite separate. And you said this perfectly, Landon, like that's some other group of folks who I completely champion and agree with there and they're, I share their values, but they're working on that and I'm working on K-12 education over here, right? So, um, you know, it was until very recently where, I, as you know, I found myself in, in a very uh, sacred space with you and Ben and others sort of stepping back, reflecting on many of the experiences I've had over the past 12 years as an elected official in Louisiana, that I think the light bulb went off in large part because of your ability to make that connection for me and Ben's ability to be like, actually, Kira, this has everything to do with strengthening democracy, the challenges you, you face as an elected official on a school board. So, so that is my first source of humility is like, I'm new to the conversation. The second, and this is a little bit more vulnerable, but very true, you know, as an elected official for 12 years, I am, I am newly retired, right? I'm getting used to saying that I am a month into my retirement um, as uh, an elected member of the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education in Louisiana, where I had the great privilege of serving for 12 years and three successful terms. Um, in many ways, I think I was unintentionally complicit in continuing to sort of invest in and believe in some very important components of um, of of my own sort of trajectory and success for how I continue to get elected, that now that I step back and look at it, think perhaps there might be a better way, right? Perhaps in some ways I was complicit in created the creation of a perpetuation of 
um, some of the, the very tactics that I think we now know enough to know we have to begin to, to explore deeply, right? So I, I say that with humility and full disclosure, right? But, but my truth is mine. And this moment is true for me now, especially that I can like look at my 12 years in, in total and say that as time went on, and I know, you know, uh, we've explored this, the two of us at, at length, so I'll be brief here, but as time went on and, you know, I continued to kind of, uh, have more and more of a, a pattern recognition to sort of the way elections um, and the way elections and governing decisions sort of tie together in my position as an elected official, I realized that there were the biggest tensions I faced, right, were tensions where um, I felt deeply responsible and accountable for the 450,000 people I was technically representing. Right, having the great privilege of representing New Orleans and six other parishes on the state board, um, and I felt on the hook and responsible because people put you put your name on the ballot and people go into a booth and they vote for you. And there is a tacit understanding that in that exchange, like you are responsible for representing this body, and I take that very seriously. Right, um, and as time went on, I started to feel the tension between that fundamental truth, which is essential to democracy. And the other fundamental truth that at least in Louisiana, but I suspect not only in Louisiana, there is a small but very powerful group of advocates, funders, others who have a deeply vested stake in um, both the outcomes of elections and ultimately the, the kind of decision making that those in those roles will make that, um, that, that they have no, no real, um, they, they have no real challenge sort of leaning in and sharing when they disagree or when they actually believe that their perspective should matter more than the 450,000 representatives that I that, that I ultimately people that I ultimately represent every day right so the tension sort of got got more and more extreme when I when I wanted to serve serve my community where promises were made right to two members of my community families educators students um educate, you know, other, others who were closest to the challenge that we sought to resolve in public education and those who were sort of more powerful but had a vested stake in these elections who really fully believed that their unique perspective should actually override and be the single one that we listen to, right? Um, yeah. I wasn't alone, right? Like this is a common experience that many, many elected officials sort of face and often the discussion that's happening behind the scenes that people can't see, you know, you see what is publicly stated on the dais, but the conversations happening away from the dais are often conversations about if I take that vote, like, am I going to lose that funding source? If I actually act in a way that is representative of my community, am I going to actually be at odds with the very people who have invested in me and put me in power? And those are often not the same groups of people, right? Um, so that is the challenge that I faced, um, and and I suspect I'm not alone in that. Kira, I just want to say thank you for being uh, uh, such a, a leader to look up to and to be so vulnerable uh, with us uh, in this uh, moment today, um, which I think, uh, turning to you, Nathan, you know, Kira is presenting a pretty important cautionary tale that I think the democracy reform community uh, and is is really interested in actually taking and transforming around. Tell us about the democracy reform community. Tell us about Rank the Vote and how you see this space, Nathan. Yeah, happy to. And uh, I'll explain why, why I'm so excited about this and why I know that uh, others interested in democracy are going to be super excited about this. So, um, so I really, you know, I just started doing this kind of work, uh, working on democracy, improving democracy as a volunteer in Massachusetts back in 2017. Uh, we had some successes there, and uh, long story short, uh, some colleagues and I, we launched a national organization with the primary goal of getting uh, regular folks engaged in improving democracy uh, in their state. And so we helped launch about 23 statewide organizations across the country. We now work with about 29,000 statewide organizations. Uh, and amongst those organizations, there's about you know four or 500,000 folks supporting the work we do, you know, people who say, yes, I, I believe in ranked choice voting in particular. And if we look at our partners and folks that are working on other important things like the reforms that you've mentioned, money in politics, moving to even year elections, 
you know, voting rights, all, things like that. It's, a, it's an even bigger number. We know the, the, uh, Americans are serious about it and more and more they're willing to, to step up and do something about it. So we've had some successes, but I would say one of the reasons I'm super excited about this is one of the things I think we could do better is a movement to both protect democracy, but also expand it and make it more robust than it ever has been is connecting um, democracy and better democracy to better outcomes in areas of our personal lives for things that we care about. And I can't think of too many issues that are more connected to each of our personal lives than education, where we all spent, you know, one or two decades as a student. <laughs> uh, maybe we've had, maybe we've been parents and had kids. Many of us have maybe been teachers or worked work on education or education reform. And to hear Kira talk about her perspective as, an, as a dedicated elected official um, working on the quality of education and, the, and how governance and education affect her ability to do what she cared about and what her job was. And I think, um, it, it, and I imagine, you know, the folks assembled here have their stories about, you know, they're, they're passionate about education. They've been working on it for a long time because they care about it. The ability to um, connect these folks who care about education with these folks who have been mainly focused on democracy is I think gonna really strengthen uh, both efforts tremendously. And so I, that's w one of the reasons I'm so thankful that this is spinning up and uh, just tickled to be part of it. I appreciate you, Nathan. And uh, that bridging connecting force, I mean, I think that's gotten us pretty excited as we've started having conversations about um, what would it mean to um, activate uh, folks on both sides uh, of these movements for a better education system and for a better democracy? There's so much there. And again, back to Sandy's original comments, that quote from John John Lewis, I mean, Congressman Lewis, is that edu if education is a cornerstone of our democracy, then what does it mean for us to reinforce it together? Um, so, uh, Kira, when you think back on your time on the uh, the state board, and we talk about some of these democracy reforms, we're just kind of throwing around here, public financing, rank choice, even year election, some of the big things, you know, what is what are some of the reactions you have as someone who's a former elected official? So I, I, I feel as though, you know, the thing that we the thing that I, I wanted to be free, free to do that became increasingly a bind that I found myself in was best represent the constituency that I raised my hand to serve. And I believe many of us who are elected in school board roles, state board roles, these are unpaid volunteer roles. Like I, I didn't even have a parking spot. I didn't even like, like people are doing this because they want to make a difference, right? You have to remember that. Um, and, and that's all I wanted to do. Right. And and when, you know, there is this explicit tension that continues between doing what you know is right and doing what you know a small, powerful group of people who have an outsized influence in elections really want you to do, it creates, it, it creates a tremendous, I think, um, dissonance for electeds. And, I, and we've spoken a little bit about this offline, Landon. I, I believe, you know, the conversations I have had with really capable promising future elected officials who are who, who are saying I wouldn't touch that like are you kidding me like the last right. thing I want to do is to like I, I saw what you you what it took for you to do this I'm not coming next right like there's many people who want to step into roles like this who are not because they are very aware of this particular dynamic and so when we look at some of the the big ideas that we're exploring here now and under the uh, the broader umbrella of democracy reform I think at the heart of it what we're trying to do is put power back into the hands of those most impacted by um by the decisions that we ultimately make in these roles right and right. and to me like that's the root of what I signed on for right so um, I think I'm, I'm really excited about that possibility, and I will be honest, and we talked about this too, um, I think if I were four years into my first term and not 12 years, um, I would be afraid. And I think it's really important to talk about that fear, right? Because I would say, okay, here I am. I'm a first year candidate. I have never run for anything ever. Right? I'm running against an eight-year incumbent. I am sure 
that my vision for education um, is is one that I believe aligns with, with the community I hope to serve. And I know because I've done the homework and I've had the listening tours and I really wanna re represent my community, but I'm broke. I don't know how to do this effectively. Like, I feel like I might need these big guns to win, right? And, and that becomes the beginning of a vicious cycle, right? That mindset, which I, which I myself had, becomes the beginning of a vicious cycle. Feel like this system, the one that has been created I have to play in the current system. There's no room to disrupt it. I've got to play the game that exists and win so that I can serve, right? And so to your question about like, what would it mean to sort of employ some of these other possibilities? I, I think it's the hope is there, but I want to be candid about the fact that we have to help electeds, current or potential future, understand that there are other ways to be successful right. that don't just get at perpetuating the same system that we exist to disrupt. Yeah, no, that's really... I, I love that insight and the the fear knowing what's uh, what I have to do versus uh, the fear of what it could be. Uh, that's a big piece of change, you know. Uh, Nathan, you know, when we, you know, the, a big part of this conversation is when when we talk to democracy experts, and as I've I gotten, if I've gotten more plugged into the democracy forum space, and we talk about how school board elections and state board races are run um, in the United States, um, people like they laugh. Uh, because we're talking about they're on odd years, they're used plurality uh, victories, uh, they don't use uh, effective electoral strategies, and um, it essentially leads to some pretty anti-democratic uh, outcomes. And I think in our politics, we hear this a lot about um, ideology uh, capturing school boards. And so um, talk to us a little bit about that and how education races could become a fertile ground for innovation and exploration that Donnie was talking about earlier. Yeah, well, um, you know, and, and uh, just uh, is um, here was saying, uh, and you know, so so the humility thing. I, I'm going to be pretty humble about my knowledge of uh, edu races because um, because I you know I know some, but but not too much. But listening to the things that are are being talked about here and mapping that to the things I am familiar with. I mean, I am I'm not living under a rock, so I know there you know. Uh, education, which something which you'd think, you know, we could all get together behind and rally around and, you know, kind of be one on is incredibly partisan, you know, whether it's in my hometown or, or anywhere. And there's different special interests that that um, have stakes in it. So I could I could see for sure where this this could be somewhere. I mean, recently we know there's all the culture issues. Um, there were all kinds of different uh, debates before that, that that I imagine a lot of you folks were involved in around how schools are administered. I guess to what I will offer to this conversation in that sense is to give a little bit of one of the, as you folks have educated me about what's going on in these edgy races and what it's like to serve in them, um, what can election reform do to make a difference and can it really make a difference? I think there's two recent examples that could give us a lot of hope. Uh, one is in New York City, where they made over the last decade, they've made a lot of changes in the way they do their elections there. And I'll use New York City as an example, a stark example of how a set of election changes can overnight very quickly change who is getting elected. Um, in New York City, they started using ranked choice voting uh, in the last few years and just for their primary elections, but New York, the primary is where the winner happens because it, it's all, it's a democratic city. So um, so in New York, about, they, they implemented not just ranked choice voting, although that was a key component. They also implemented robust public financing and term limits. And, uh, and then in addition to that, they had advocates who saw the importance of more women being represented in New York City government. And so the first election where, you know, the term limits had really opened up a lot of seats and ranked choice voting was being used for the first time and they had the robust public financing regime in place, the New York City City Council went from 27% women to 61% women in one election. And this is like, I don't know, 50 seats or something. So this is the power of democracy reform to impact who is getting elected. Uh, and then the other example, which I'll just allude to briefly, is Alaska became the second state to implement ranked choice voting um, back in 2020 by ballot measure. 
and they used it for the first time in 2022. With, and there were a lot of different impacts. I want to focus on the, it became the first state to use it to elect their entire state legislature. And before ranked choice voting in the Alaska legislature, there was a lot of, as you can imagine, like anyone who's familiar with Congress or maybe your state, they were, there was a lot of gridlock and there was a lot of um, partisan gridlock over how to, a, a huge issue for them, which is how to, it, how to use the, uh, the revenues from their permanent fund. They make a lot of money on the oil. It's Alaska and it's nice that they are able to harness a lot of the, the money from that for, for the public good, but they couldn't agree on how to use it. And then there was a lot of um, a lot of gridlock over education reform, which is badly needed, education funding and reform. So the after one election, they went from this gridlock to um, to a situation where in the Senate they had a the Senate, which is twenty members, they had a governing caucus of uh, seventeen out of the twenty. <laughs> there was nine Democrats, eight Republicans. A Republican speaker, a Republican Senate president, they agreed to sort of put the wedge issues aside and focus on the important stuff. And they began to make pr tremendous progress on these issues that uh, they hadn't been able to move on. So, so I think that it's great. I think that, you know, seeing this connection between important issues like education and democracy and seeing how places that have made the move to improve their democracy have fared, uh, I, think we can, I think we can have a lot of hope. I appreciate that, Nathan. Um, we got just our final round of questions here. You know, one of the things I'm thinking about uh, as Nathan was talking, Kira, is just about how so many of our future elected officials come through our school elections, school boards, uh, mm -hmm. state board races, um, and the implications of doing election and democracy differently in those races and what that spillover effect could be across our entire body politic, across all of our representatives. Kira, you know, there's a lot of folks uh, out there in education who might say, oh, there's a ton of issues we got to work on. Um, there's a lot of things happening in education. Why this? Why now? Yeah. Look, I, 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 every, uh, people might answer this differently, but from where I sit and what I see, I, I think about some of the most important education reforms um, that, that may have worked but, die, but basically died on the vine because the political public will was not sustainable, right? Was not there. And, you know, there are many lessons that we can draw upon over the past 20 years, those of us who have now going into third and fourth decades in this. But one thing is, you know, like the circumventing of a community, like a true community will, a true base of people willing to fight for the very changes that, they believe are going to best serve their children continues to be um, a resounding truth that is still under, under understood in our education reform efforts today, right? In 2024. And so when we think about what it really takes to sustain big, important change, right? Like that cannot happen without those most affected feeling the most certain that those changes should happen. And instead, we've sort of built an electoral politics system, at least in, in sections of education reform, where we sort of think we can circumvent that and we're gonna create great ideas and get those ideas done. And then we're gonna sell them to the people who need them and everyone's gonna believe it needs to work. And I just have too many examples over the past 20 years in my own life and career where I've actually seen that missed opportunity to really do the hard work of true cultivation, community understanding of what actually works and, and have the power come from folks who are most impacted by it, right? And, and this is an example, right? Democracy reform as we're talking about it is one, one more really important way where I think education reform should adopt the principle of wanting those most impacted by the changes that we say we believe in to actually be driving that change. And if we can't get clear on that, right, um, then, then we do so at our own peril. Yeah. And, and that for me is the most important reason why I think right, like it should have happened before. When you say why, why now, the reason why it's not easy for me to answer that question is that it should have happened already, but here we are. And I think there's a real opportunity to like, draw that principle and those values towards us. Um, and this is, it, and I think, I feel very clear and optimistic that this is one pathway to do that. 
I love that, Kira. And uh, um, it's really inspiring to me. You know, Donnie and I often uh, use a phrase where, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago, but the second best time is now. Right. Um, and uh, I feel like that has to be our call to action for uh, the democracy work. Uh, Nate, Nate. Nathan, um, you know, similar question from the democracy reform side. Why, you know, what's your call to action for folks in the democracy reform space to begin to partner more aggressively with folks in the education space? Well, you know, I I really think I think one thing we've seen there's there's a lot of different ways we're working to win democracy reform. Um, I would say some of the most inspiring in the last few years have been the cases that fit the model that uh, Kira describes of the people most impacted taking up the cause to move it forward. I think it uh, it produces the most momentum. It makes the reforms the most enduring. And it, of course, makes them fit best with the communities that are looking for the changes. So I think that the, um, the purpose that, you know, the education movement is bringing to this and the, um, the clear goals they have around what, what they, their vision for what they want the education and you know, education co-creation process to be is going to be infectious and inspiring for the democracy uh, community. So, um, so I think it's just I, th I think it's going to be uh, really um, a great partnership in that sense. And I, I think that as these two communities begin communicating more together and seeing where each want to be, they're going to be like, oh wow, why isn't it like you said about the ten years thing? Why is it take us this long to get together? This it's going to be great. And we're probably going to have some fun parties together, probably. I could probably imagine. A lot of fun things to do together. A lot of fun conversations. Um, I'm going to do a, you know, a virtual round of applause. Uh, I'll do a round of applause in person because I'm off mute uh, for our, our uh, incredible co-chairs. Thank you for agreeing to step into this space to help us move forward uh, here, both Kira and Nathan, and uh, really can't wait to unlock those connections even more uh, deeply in the process. Um, you got it. Um, I'm going to ask everyone right now, we want the chat to be interactive. I'd love for folks to go into that chat and just drop a, a reflection or a thought that they have from uh, Kira and Nathan's discussion, a comment they made or a reflection you had on your work um, as we get ready to gear up for the next uh, section. So uh, drop, uh, drop a thought into that chat, um, something that you heard, something that you connected with as you think about your work. Um, I see folks from across uh, the ecosystem here, um, you know, in democracy and education. Um, so uh, use that chat to kind of highlight some of those pieces. Okay. And it looks like the board games, that's the big thing. I, th I believe that a Alex Cortez will throw down some pretty good board game energy uh, between democracy reform and education reform. Um, uh, the next thing that we're going to do uh, here is really move into that uh, learning, uh, this learning session. Um, and uh, this is going to be an opportunity uh, for us just to quickly go through some of the uh, ideas and reforms and solution set that could be a possibility. Back to Sandy's point in the survey, um, we think that there's a tremendous opportunity to educate us literally as an education community about the democracy reform opportunities uh, that, ex that exists. Uh, so um, with that, um, we're gonna, I'm going to invite a, a friend and colleague and a neighbor of mine, Elizabeth Batiste. Uh, who's a democracy reform uh, guru that I've gotten to know over the past uh, eight year or so. Um, and she's going to walk us through pretty quickly some of our, our uh, first uh, set of potential uh, and shed, these electoral redesign components and how they might operate in education. Uh, then we'll turn it over to Ben Austin to talk about uh, the governance redesign and, and then I'll be uh, talk through some of the potential other ideas that might be out there as well. So this is, again, the beginning of a conversation about uh, upgrading that education uh, democracy infrastructure, um, or uh, as Sandy told me today, get under the hood uh, of education uh, democracy. So with that, Elizabeth, why don't you introduce yourself and we'll go to the first one here. Excellent. Thank you, Landon. Um, my name is Elizabeth Batiste. I'm based out of Denver. I am a 
individual consultant and I've done a lot of work on democracy reform, whether it's redistricting reform, ranked choice voting and open primaries. Um, so very glad to be joining everyone today. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the um, electoral redesigns that some of these things may already be uh, taking place in your state. There are probably different efforts that are working on um, these different issues from a, a different perspective or different lens, but uh, we wanted to kind of start by setting the table and um, kind of go over some of the the electoral redesign that we think could be really helpful, as Landon said. Uh, the first, as Nathan was talking a, a bit about, is ranked choice voting in, in edgy races. Um, ranked choice voting has been shown to uh, build broad-based support for winners because it's it gets rid of that lesser of two evils um, aspect to it. And it also has been found to motivate candidates to focus on positive campaigning and putting those policies first rather than attacking their opponent. Um, that really brings people in to the process and helps build consensus rather than the mudslinging that we're really seeing um, right now. Um, we've also seen, and Represent Women um, has really recently really recently released a great study on how the ranked choice voting promotes diversity among candidates and elected officials. Um, and we know that that uh, diversity and thought is extremely important in the education community as well, so that we can really bring different um, perspectives to the table as we are making decisions. Um, and it also, RCV has also been shown to increase voter turnout and engagement. A lot of that is because RCV encourages more positive campaigning. Um, and it also uh, can help decrease voter fatigue. So uh, as an example here in Denver, we just had a municipal election that had uh, 16 different candidates on the ballot. Um, and this will, and we had two, two elections. So an effort like this um, would combine that into one election so that voters aren't having to go to the polls uh, time and time again. And it can, it, during these times of budget cuts, especially uh, with municipal municipal election offices and county clerks, um, it can also be a huge cost saver. Next slide. Um, and with even year and aligned voting, um, we know that uh, education races aren't necessarily traditionally the, the most participated in. And a lot of that is because um, they don't take place during the higher turnout elections. So uh, we'd love to start a conversation about different states uh, aligning those education races with even year or other uh, major elections to increase that turnout. Um, as we all probably know, uh, that higher voter participation will lead to more participative um, governing bodies. And it will also allow voters to stay more engaged and informed um, because the education issues will be elevated in the larger election context rather than trying to shout into the void of, of an off-year election or an election that may not be getting, um, getting as much uh, attention. And it's also another way to uh, get those cost, sa cost savings like what we were talking about with ranked choice voting by reducing the administrative expenses of having multiple elections um, and condens condensing those into one. Um, and another uh, tactic would be public finance. Um, public finance really does increase the investment that voters feel in the races, and it really levels that playing field, um, uh, enabling candidates from different backgrounds to compete effectively. Um, restricting dark money is something that we talk about a lot in the democracy reform space, um, and uh, curbing down on uh, dark money and outside spending um, will really help put the the candidates policies and their priorities forward rather than allowing you know outside individuals to be really dictating these races um and shifting the folk the candidates focus from fundraising to policy and community building and really focusing on building those coalitions that it will take to actually govern while they're uh, running for election will be really pivotal um it's right now we're seeing you know, it's just a, a race to the bottom with fundraising. It, it seems like that's really the, the candidate's number one priority in a lot of different races, uh, from education races on up. Um, and so public funding can kind of help level that playing field and shift that focus from fundraising day in and day out to their ideas and what they want to accomplish in the role. Um, and 
public financing can also, as I said, it, it uh, increases their level of investment, but it also can increase the trust in the process. So we know where that money is coming from. We know that all the candidates have that kind of same level of foundation, and it's really the policies and priorities that will dictate who, who wins the day. And then finally, there's a lot of there's a number of ways that we can um, expand the vote. I think one of the most interesting uh, pieces of this that I haven't worked on but has really um, popped up a, a lot in our conversations is lowering the voting age to 16 in education races uh, to directly engage students in that process. I know that there's a lot of efforts to like pre-register people before they turn 18 and that sort of thing, but um, I think. In, in engaging and involving and empowering students to participate directly in those elections could be a, a really for a really huge force multiplier um, and get them in the habit of um, of participating in our elections down the line. Um, and then another idea that's been floated is expanding voting power to parents currently not eligible to vote um, in edgy races so that they still have. Um, a say in their children's future and, and how our um, education system operates. And um, we also talk a lot about expanding the voting age to promote um, education policies that are better reflective of the people that are living through them every day. Um, so those are just some of the electoral reforms that we've been talking about. And obviously, you layer some of those on, you, you figure out, you know, what mix might work in your state or what mix some folks may already be working on and they could really um come together to make a, a tremendous difference in the representation and the approachability and participation in our elections awesome elizabeth thank you so much for that and going through that so uh, efficiently um i'm gonna turn it over to ben now to talk about uh the governance uh redesign opportunities uh starting off with his uh, passion purpose project, uh, education as a uh, quality education and civil right. Thanks, Landon. Uh, you know, I think we don't talk enough in the education space about our, the unique challenge that we as advocates for children have, um, which is that we are advocating for a constituency that is constitutionally shut out from participating in democracy. We serve a constituency that is literally not allowed to vote. Uh, and even their parents in places like where I work, Los Angeles, many of them are many of them are not allowed to vote because they're not citizens. Um, and and so, um, you know, it, we are in in a lot of ways playing a rigged game. And by comparison, like the person who runs the Social Security Administration doesn't have politicians banging down their door trying to mess with Social Security because older people vote and AARP exists. Um, and so governance reform is fundamentally about reorienting the physics of education policymaking uh, so that transactional actors, not heroes like Kira Orange Jones, who are willing to rage against the machine and put up with what it takes to advocate for kids in the current system, um, but, but transactional actors who are good people but just want to keep their jobs, don't want to stick their neck out too much, to incentivize them to actually serve the interests of children, especially low-income children, children of color, undocumented children. Um, making quality public education a uh, an actionable civil right, a, a civil right as a, um, a, a civil right for children, not just a sound bite. Um, that is, uh, I'm, I'm quite biased in this analysis, but uh, that is the, the most sweeping uh, and systemic move that we can make as education advocates. Um, to reorient the physics of education policy making, we can get into the details as Landon's going to announce at the uh, end um, of the uh, of this session that we're now going to be hosting monthly sessions, and I think one of the first monthly policy discussions is going to be around making quality public education an actionable civil right, in part because it was the uh, clear winner uh, in terms of support and issues that people wanted to work on. But if quality public education uh, were a civil right uh, tomorrow, because it's not for any child in America effectively, children in America right now have a right to a free education, um, but an education of no quality whatsoever. Um, that came up during the pandemic when my daughters uh, were LAUSD students and were shut out from going to school 
for a year and a half. Uh, during that time, parents in Los Angeles uh, raised money through a GoFundMe page to sue the LAUSD to reopen all schools for all kids. Um, and the LAUSD in their pleading said the quiet part out loud uh, that is that is applicable to every child in America. They said that because children in Los Angeles do not have a civil right to high quality public education, the LAUSD has no legal obligation to deliver a quality public education, and parents have no legal standing to ask the district to reopen schools or ask them to do anything else, that we get what we get and we don't get upset. Uh, and so fundamentally, um, this is about reorienting the incentive structures of the system uh, by forcing districts to think about the interests of children uh, and forcing big bureaucracies to consider the interests of children um, when when making policies. Um, we can go on to the next uh, uh, issue. Next slide, please. Um, students uh, as voting members of the school board. Um, uh, I, I was uh, not a longstanding uh, uh, State Board of Education member uh, or an elected official like Kira, but I did for a brief period of time serve as an appointed member of the California uh, State Board of Education. And in California does have a voting school board member. And um, for me, I, I was incredibly helpful and edifying to have a student um, who didn't have some patronizing advisory position, um, uh, but was actually a voting member, uh, just like everybody else, uh, to bring their perspective. And very often I voted with him and listened to him and changed my votes uh, because he was bringing a perspective of, of um, the, a very unique perspective that was highly underrepresented oftentimes in the debates we were having. Um, and so uh, students as a voting member on a school board uh, would be um, potentially transformational, not just because it would add an extra vote, but I think quite persuasive uh, to other school board members, especially if those other school board members were elected by ranked choice voting and were accountable to the actual will of the people. Um, next slide, please, Landon. Uh, proportional multi-member uh, representation. Um, uh, l l this is an issue that Landon has been educating me on, uh, not the other way around. Um, but it is just just to state the obvious: um, sc uh, school boards are not immune from the gerrymandering that has undermined like the fundamentals of our democracy from Congress down to the local level. Um, and so, you know, t um, analyzing. Um, district representation so that even if we get ranked choice voting, public financing, et cetera, um, to make sure that key constituencies are represented, it may require um, expanding the number of board members um, and or implementing um, new new theories of change like multi-member uh, board seats. I think that's it, Landon. Great. Thank you, Ben. Um, there's a few other ideas that we want to make sure uh, we put into the hopper and, you know, really our vision for uh, co-creating Cornerstone with you and so many other people around the country is that we want to put all the options and solution sets on the table for people in local communities to begin having conversations about what makes sense for them. Um, so some other ideas that we know are really powerful in the democracy reform space are uh, voting by mail, uh, making sure that everyone has access uh, to their ballot, um, family expenses, which means... Uh, uh, actually, in a lot of states, it's actually illegal for someone to raise money and then pay for childcare while they're on a campaign um, that's changing around the country. And you can imagine the type of effect that has on working parents running for office. Um, so it's a major opportunity for reform to create some equities uh, inside the system. Um, restoration of voting rights. Uh, we know that a significant amount of people in this country have had their right to vote stripped away. Um, restoring that right, and then uh, and many of those folks are parents. Um, so how could they uh, actually, through the restoration of their right, be able to work and vote and participate in their local democracy in their kids' uh, education system? And then mobile voting. Um, you know, uh, this is a kind of emergent technology that's being shown to have a lot of promise, and in particular uh, for a lot of uh, community members uh, that actually are really interested in uh, act, creating more access to the voting opportunity, um, in play, especially in places where there's not mail-in balloting. Um, what does it mean to actually be able to vote from your phone? Um, a lot of questions around that, I'm sure, for people in the room, but an emerging technology uh, that is really interesting for uh, folks uh, overall. 
Um, so now we've kind of reached the end of our learning session. I'm going to throw something in the chat here uh, that's a little bit of a document uh, that we've put together that actually showcases uh, pieces of uh, research, um, videos, explainers, FAQs on all these various issues. Um, we know that you might be in a community and thinking about, uh, I want to learn more about students on boards. I want to learn about uh, multi-member uh, representation. I want to learn more about public financing. Um, this document is a compendium, a codex of a ton of these different resources for you to start digging into yourself, and in particular, as Ben mentioned, as we go on a learning journey. So um, what we're going to do next is start to have a conversation amongst ourselves um, in region. I'm going to turn it over to Donnie to walk us through this. Hey, everybody. Uh, so this next section is motivated by two theories. One, uh, really cool people should always be in community with one another and should get a chance to talk. Uh, two, we know that there's an incredible amount of work that's already being done in all of these different regions uh, and that we want to surface that, connect it to each other and to this you know, sort of broader initiative. Uh, and then also surface things that we are curious about and that we want to learn more about as well. Uh, the resource that Landon just popped into the chat is an incredible tool. But we also know that if we can sort of see some patterns about what people are particularly interested in, it might help us understand sort of next steps for the network as well. Um, and so you can see here that we have this map and we're going to pull some regional groups together. Uh, and there's going to also be a uh, note taker in each of these rooms to facilitate the discussion. Uh, and we're going to discuss the following three key questions in the next slide. First, uh, regarding all of this incredible context that Elizabeth and Ben and Kira and Nathan have already shared with us, what do you want to learn more about? Uh, and then secondly, what do you wonder about regarding this project, the Cornerstone project? Uh, what are some curiosities, questions uh, that are coming to your mind? And then third, what are you already working on that might be aligned? What are some things that you just want to surface and let people know uh, is, is happening in your context? So uh, with that, I think we are gonna just split out for just over 10 minutes um, and give people a chance to connect with one another and get some of these thoughts out there. Uh, and there will be a note taker in each room, as I mentioned. And so I think we're just ready to rock and roll. Uh, thanks for making that happen, uh, Claudia. I really appreciate you uh managing uh some of those pieces um i'm gonna uh, uh we're kind of moving to our uh our uh last uh section here which is really just kind of next steps and, and uh gratitude uh for uh what we've kind of all been a part of are people uh seeing my screen here is it good okay great um so uh before we jump into that um i just would love to uh, also invite people in the chat uh just to drop in um, any insights from the discussion, anything that popped uh, that was on people's minds, uh, anything coming up? And um, if just maybe uh, for a minute, if there's any um, from some of our facilitators, note catchers, Elizabeth, Donnie, Sandy, Ben, uh, uh, any any thoughts or reflections from the convos? Um, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll I'll just start. Um, we had a, a a badass crew in the Western uh, region. Um, uh, we had uh, a, a great conversation about how, from a community organizing standpoint, parents um, uh, just aren't, there's not an incentive structure for staff and the bureaucracy to listen to parents. And this movement is fundamentally about altering that. Uh, there, and, and parents having a seat at the table in the policymaking process. We also had um, great representation um, from about student voice, the importance of intergenerational collaboration, students have been full voting members on, on the school board um, and got some really terrific feedback about both uh, the how we go about doing this is as important as the what um, and that we make sure this is not a, a top down um, kind of ivory tower effort, that this is a rooted in com authentic community needs and, and feedback, and that this is a real opportunity to kind of unsilo work that's traditionally been funded um, in silos, uh, but but that we should be eyes wide open that education, uh, politics, and democracy reform oftentimes 
have two very different political centers of gravity that can be huge opportunities, but also sources of uh, potential tension. Awesome. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a great share out. Elizabeth, what are you thinking? Yeah, and kind of to build off of what Ben said, um, I think the Midwest group was uh, very excited about um, taking these policies and ideas and really empowering students to run with them. So really taking that student-centered approach. And I think um, having them uh, represented on school boards was was very uh, exciting to the to the Midwest group. Awesome. Uh, anything, uh, last, last comments? The Mountain West group, I think we had a Tony asked a very provocative question, and I shared this in the group, but Tony was a really instrumental thought partner at the beginning of this project to me, so I'm just honored he's here. And he asked a big question about how big of a tent uh, do we build and how we have people with different ideas about education um, and how do we hold that together in pursuit of a stronger democracy. And um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question, but I think we're aspiring for um, a, a, a place and a learning environment where we can start to have those conversations. Um, and that, I think, is the part of the beginning. Um, Donnie, Sandy, any last thoughts? Yeah, I would just say the Northeast is a little bit chilly, uh, but but we had a really good conversation. We really started a good conversation. I think um, there was a lot of talk about how um, making some reforms locally, right, uh, in like local school board races really could be a, a pilot, right? It really could mm -hmm. lead to proof of concept of what could be done more broadly. So a lot of interest in thinking about how we uh, maybe start local and uh, and see where it can go. A lot of interest in uh, making sure that uh, 16, 17, and 18 year olds are voting in school board races, increasing turnout, uh, wondering about who we could collaborate with, and an interest in uh, creating uh, some communications around these ideas that show the through line between education and democracy, right? That mm -hmm. We've started that conversation, but there's a lot of work to be done to socialize this idea within our own organizations and communities. Um, and also ensuring this goes back to the idea of like, you know, the question about the tent, um, but a, a lot of good cautions that uh, we don't want, you know, we want this to be um, not a partisan movement, mm -hmm. right? This is, this is, um, this, this is for everyone who wants to um, expand um, and strengthen democracy. So uh, again, that's also going to be a communications challenge. Appreciate that, Sandy. <laughs> uh, Donnie, quick thought. I think that our group was just really excited to think about how all of this could help local governance of school boards just work. Uh, to They've become ideological battlegrounds because we really haven't invested people in the act of making their school systems uh, powerful and functional. Uh, and that's led to this greater nationalization of, of a lot of these races. And we just want to pull it back into the locus of control that it really should be situated in. So excited to continue this. I love it. Um, well, uh, we are want to continue the learning journey uh, with you all. Um, and uh, we have, uh, we're committing to hosting uh, sessions on these topics over the coming months. Um, you'll be receiving uh, emails from us uh, about these sessions. Um, we wanna really focus March on the expanded voting uh, for students and students on boards. Uh, April, uh, education is civil right and May uh, rank choice voting. And then we'll kind of keep working through uh, the list overall because it's a really powerful uh, uh, opportunity for shared learning and discussion. And um, as I think folks in, in my session, and other places mentioned overall, like we have a lot of learning to do, like how do these pieces work together and how does it look uh, and how does it come together? Um, and we want to be on that learning journey on with you all on that, because if we're really going to commit to upgrading our education infrastructure, we have a lot to do to get sharper about that as an education community. And uh, it begins with the learning. Um, and so, uh, and with that, um, I just want to say thank you uh, for joining. Uh, thank you for uh, spending your uh, very valuable time with us. Seeing so many uh, friends and colleagues from around uh, the country is really exciting. You have a, a, a next. You have a survey in front of you right now. Thank you, Claudia. If you could take um, a minute to answer those pieces and uh, maybe just drop a, a, a comment or, or a piece of gratitude in the in the chat as you're on your way out and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>